Hi, welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Show. I'm Joe Foster, founder of Reebok. And that is some time ago now, but founder of Reebok. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Joe. It's great to have you. And over your right shoulder is the book that I've so enjoyed, which you wrote recently, Shoemaker. Uh, the whole story about how you uh, took over the business from grandfather to father to you, uh, but how you turned it into this world leading brand uh, today, which everybody knows Reebok. And it's, it's a huge achievement. Let's, let's firstly tell us uh, about the book and why did you decide to write it? Um, I, I'd be interested to hear about that, Joe. Well, you know, you go through life and uh, you, so many people say, why don't you write your book? You don't think you're that important. <laughs> you don't think you've done anything that special. And I think it does take time when you settle down, you sit back and you reflect and think, oh, why do we do that? How do we do that? Yeah? It's amazing, right? And I think even today, I wonder, I wonder today, how would I do that? So when it, when it came to the book, many people have said, write it. And then yeah, you're looking at uh, Wikipedia, you, you're looking at Google, and you're reading all about yourself. Uh, that never happened. Hmm. And somebody's invented that. So it takes a little while. And I think, no, 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 it, it's about time we got this straight. Let's try and get it this as straight as we can. So that was the inspiration. I'd taken some time off and uh, we're talking seven years ago. It took that long to get, to get this book from thinking about it to starting writing to having a lot of people help. Because it's amazing when, yeah, I'm a shoemaker as the title of the book. Um, I'm not a writer, but I have a story. And so I needed the help to make the story really run properly. Because I'm writing this and I'm one, two, three, you do this. Then all of a sudden, I, but we did this as well. So you're doing two or three times, two or three things at the same time. You're juggling this. So to get it into a book, you need help. But that, you know, the inspiration was, well, let's start. Whoever knew that my grandfather, Joe Foster, born in 1880, would make himself a pair of spike track shoes in 1895. And that that was if not the invention, it was certainly the pioneering of track shoes. So that's why I, I decided I, I would write the book. Yeah, well, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I'm dyslexic, so my way of um, enjoying books is to listen. And I think in two years, I've listened to 160 different books. So I really enjoyed yours. I put it on my website, jonathanperks.com, or I will be doing later on today, just to say how much I enjoyed it and to give people the link to both uh, Amazon and to Audible because it's, it's good listening to it. And I was thinking back as a lad growing up in Halifax in, and we talked about Jack Lees and Terry Higgins <laughs> and, and, and the, um, uh, the Halifax connection where you, you did uh, some of your selling and they were, so, they were so good and supportive of you. But just hearing the story about grandfather, put, making these spikes up and, and almost crippling himself with, with this, the first version that he'd done and then improving on it and how, how good it was, uh, how successful he was, grandfather, but yet somehow to father and your uncle, they didn't really work together. You know, grandfather was very successful. Father and uncle didn't really work well together. You didn't kind of get that support. And then you came in with your brother and the rest is, is legendary. But of course, there were so many highs and lows and, and so many ripping stories in that. And you were, you know, it was edgy use heat stuff that you were reading about, you know, was it going to happen? Well, of course, you knew it was going to happen because it's so famous. But then you thought, how did they get through that one? So take me back to when you were a, a young lad growing up. What, what were some of the things that shaped you that later on gave you that drive to keep going against all the odds, uh, Joe, tell me. Well, I, I think there, there, there are numerous things. I think the two things that were very important to both Jeff and myself was that we were both brought up during the war, World War II. I was born in 35, so by 1939, just four years old. Hardly any memories of pre-war. During the war, blacker, no lights, nothing. Uh, schools? We didn't go to school. We went to the front room of a teacher. They were teaching it at home. <clears throat> so, you know, you grow up just, just normally. But what happened is that the church, 
the church was the center of everybody's social life, uh, whatever. I think of the church that we went to, they had bowling greens, they had tennis courts, we had scouts, we had cubs, you know, the whole sort of life was there. And I think that being in scouts did give us a discipline because we had a very good scout master. It wasn't just, well, come on lads, we'll just do this, just do that. No, it was quite strict. And so I think that, and also doing two years national service yes. gives you that discipline. <clears throat> I think the discipline that we, we both learned was incredible. We could see bad things, you could see good things. And of course, we're growing up, we knew nothing about grandfather. We knew we set up this, uh, this sort of sports business. And, but you, you know, when you're kids, that's normal. You don't think that there's anything special about uh, your, your dad making spike running shoes or even football boots, you know, and our local hero, Nat Lofthouse, for making football boots. Yeah, oh, great, that's fantastic. <clears throat> so growing up, um, I, think, I think we got that. You couldn't do an awful lot during the war. You didn't know the difference, but you know, there's no lights. So we enjoyed no lights on the street. <clears throat> we were running round in the darkness and whatever. And we grew up, of course. By the time I'm 10, the war is over, all of a sudden, Somebody's put the lights on. Street lights. <laughs> this is different again, isn't it? And so I, I, I think that, that that bringing up we uh, we had the disciplines, I think that means that when you're doing something, you you know you've got to do it right. Mm, yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. And, and you learnt some good lessons and some bad lessons. You you know, you, you had a, a famous grandfather who'd, who'd been such a successful shoemaker father and brother inherited it but they they never really got their act together they were always against each other what what's your learning from that that uh you took forward with jeff your brother and how you worked together compared to how your your dad and uncle did again i think a lot of it was um we didn't sort of sit down and say now we're going to do it this way <laughs> we're going to do it different <clears throat> Um, I think a lot is by, by accident, and it's maybe that you're unconscious of the fact that you were doing it because you realised that they didn't. Um, we, we went all the way through. In fact, we're, we're probably 10 years into Reebok before we really found out grandfather. <laughs> we, we'd got little bits and snippets, but by the time we were into Reebok, we were able to do some research. And we found out how brilliant he was. I mean, He's only 15 years old, makes his own pairs of running shoes. Everybody wants them, of course, because, well, you know, he's either, he's either a cheat or a genius. Which is it? <clears throat> if you make us all running shoes, you're a genius. <laughs> if you don't, you're a cheat. So that's his business. And by 1900, he had his own business, making running shoes. By 1904, <clears throat> he had three world records in his shoes. And that was in one event in, in Glasgow with Alf Shrubs. Then he was World War I, took away the second generation really of uh, the 1900s there. And it was 1920 before Joe again came back. And we, we have letterhead from the 1920s. And on the letterhead, I think I counted there's 96 teams, all of the football teams which we now are in the Premiership. I think there's only one, Tottenham Hotspur that I couldn't find, but Arsenal, Liverpool, Manchester City, Man United, Everton. Glasgow, Celtic, all, all the teams he was supplying with boots and with spikes. Brilliant. And, and at that time, you, he also, on his letter, it says, supplier to the Antwerp Olympic Games, all competitors. So everybody, I mean, we're talking really in those days, we're just talking track and field because the Olympics has grown into something massive. But this was track and field. And during the 1920s, he had lots and lots of gold medals and chariots of fire. Yes. People of my age remember that. Oh, I love Cherish. Um, it was one of my favourite, favourite films. Yeah, Eric Little. Um, and in fact, in, fact, in fact, just to say with that, Joe, um, as you know, being a runner myself and long distance running was my thing. My only claim to fame, if it's a claim to fame, is I hold the world record for the Cypress Double Mountain Marathon. So it's from <laughs> sea level up to 6,000 feet and back down right. again. But you, you navigate. It's, it's teams from all over the world come from different military units. And uh, eight hours and nine minutes, two marathons, staying overnight, and then you do the next one. But I remember as we came towards the finish, 
there was the commanding officer of the Scots Guards who I was in, in a helicopter shouting, come on, Jonathan, come on, the Scots Guards, on a megaphone from a helicopter. <laughs> and the battalion was waiting with the finish of this thing called Cyprus Walkabout, which it wasn't a walk, it was a, it was a run in the heat. <laughs> and uh, we had backpacks. And, and, and it was those moments of chariot of fire. And I felt like I was, you know, it was all slowed Eric down with, with the music, like <laughs> Eric, Eric Little. So I, I really relate to that. And, and that's why the story of Shoemaker is so mm. special to me. Um, in all that you happen, and, and people have got to listen to your book, they've got to read it. It's a great read. And I've, I, I've obviously read the, the Nike one as well. And, um, but I think this one has more edge. It's more, more personable. Uh, the, the Nike one's interesting, but it's this is more more personable, and um, it, it's also it, it's also a British story, which is quite special to me. And uh, though, though of course, you know, it's now a, a global a global brand. But I was just thinking, as you were growing up, you had some highs and you had some lows. What would have been the happiest moment in your in your life, Joe? And what would have been the darkest moment? And what did you learn from both that shaped the man you became? When you say growing up, at what sort of age are we talking about, or is it any, you know, any age? Any age throughout your life, throughout your life, your your happiest moment, and then perhaps your your darkest, saddest moment. Well, I think the happiest moments are going to be during the Reebok, uh, the, the growth, and when we when we became number one. When I actually got into the American market, I got the hook. That when Aztec became a five star shoe, that was something fantastic. You, you try and compare it with many other things and, and many things happen in life. You, you win things, you lose things. And, and of course, some of the worst moments. So my brother dying, that was tragic for me. And, and my daughter dying as well. Mm. These are the real low moments. Everything else you can cope with. Yeah. yeah. Things like that you can't change. Yeah. You know, we had lots of, oh, yeah. we had to change our name because uh, we couldn't register it. And, we didn't feel that as a low moment. That was a challenge. We didn't like it. But then, you know, then when you start looking at challenges, when you start to get your teeth onto it and say, well, okay, you know, let, and we find something better. We yeah. find Reebok. This yeah. becomes, well, you know, what was that? Was that fate? Or was it luck? You know, mm -hmm. how did we do that? And then we were only four years into our business and I did us write as a letter. Uh, from the solicitor to say that we're infringing the three stripes. We, we, our silhouette was two stripes and a T-bar. And again, it was more, oh, I did just right into us. Wow. But we got them worried was probably a bit of, uh, <laughs> excessive, but yeah, we got, you know, they, they, they've seen us, they've recognized us. So mm. again, it was okay, you know, we, we, we can't take them on. This is not something that we start writing letters and, you know, no, no, what can we do? So we change. And again, yeah. we find something. I think yeah. we were inspired by the tail fin of British Airways, or was it probably BOAC then, where they had yeah. this, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. wing thing on the back there. I think that inspired yeah. you know, the idea. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so we change. And we went through lots and lots of this. But then we talk about... My father and uncle, their, their, their father was a genius. And we can go back to say how we influenced a lot of people. Today, we hear so much about influencers. And this is how your brand grows. But he must have given his shoes to uh, Al Shrub. And, said, uh, and same with the Olympics. He, he obviously gave the shoes. They wore them. And then that influenced other people to buy the shoes. And so he had all this. And then he died in 33. 1933 died, uh, 15 months before I was born in 1935, and I was born on his birthday. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah, that's, so. that's uncanny. <laughs> that's okay. Now, thinking about birthdays and growing up, um, imagine you're sort of thinking back to your time when you were 16 years old uh, and knowing all the things you've learned and all the hard knocks that you've had and experiences that you've had. What bit of advice would you give to a the young Joe Foster, uh, if you went back to that time, about what doesn't matter and what really is important? Well, I, th I think the beauty of it is that you don't know. Because if you did know, you would be very, very, it, it would be so difficult to, if you could tell the future, if you could see it and you knew it was there, you wouldn't make, you wouldn't 
challenge things. Yeah. When we set off in business, I was 23 and Jeff was 25. We were young. We were totally indestructible. Yeah, we could do it. Yeah. Well, you so you leave the business, you, you your parents' business, you, you have no money. No, but we've got a lot of guts. We, we, yeah, grit, I think. <laughs> grit. It's okay, we can do this. We, we, we start our business in a, a rundown brewery, an old brewery, Berry Brewery, which was, there was hardly a slate on the roof. I mean, we had that many tin cans and buckets up on the top floor just catching water. And, you know, if I'd have known this at 16, would I? Would, would I be putting myself into, well, at 16, you know, no difference. Yeah. So I don't think you can do that. And, then, you know, people say, you know, would you do it again? And I say, I would do it again if I didn't know. You know or, because the things that, the things like we said, you know, what are the upsets? It's when people die or something you just can't change. You know, yeah. you know if, if a problem comes out, it's a problem. If something like death comes out, you, that is something that you wish you could change. Yeah. You wish, but yeah. you know very well that, that you know that, that that can't happen. So what would I say to to Joe? I'd say don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Joe. So Joe, let's go around the inspiring leadership compass. Um, the thing that we've looked at, you know, performance has been your thing. We did the research into what makes high performing leaders and teams. Uh, and we develop these eight elements. Uh, and let's just go around them and see what your wisdom is and your experience on that. The first one is what we call MQ or moral quotient, moral intelligence. You know, your values, your integrity, your foundational values that you've lived by. So if you had top three, top three values that you've tended to live by, what are they? Or what did you do when you let them slip? And how do you get yourself back onto living the values? Well, I, I think the values to me... <laughs> We, we used to sit down later on in Reebok and, and we would sort of say, okay, now, what are the most three most important things? And every time, we had, what are the most? fun, fun, and fun. <laughs> that was it to me. You, if you don't have fun, you don't have anything. Yeah. But then, also, what is so important, as far as I'm concerned, is integrity. Mm. I think you have to have that integrity. If you want to change something because you've made a mistake, tell everybody you've made a mistake. Make sure that people know that you feel that way. So integrity for me um, is so important. And the other one is keep going. Yeah. It's like, okay, things will happen from the side, whatever, but keep going. So integrity, keep going and have fun. Yeah, that, those are great ones. And you and I have met another podcaster that we had on the series, uh, Devin Harris, who's a friend of a, a, my, my best man from Jamaica. Uh, Errol right. uh, and his his motto is keep on pushing you know because there he was with the bobsleigh team yep. and sure. uh, the training in Jamaica with a big sled running around the road uh, trying to pretend they were one day going to be on the ice uh, doing the Cresta run. Uh, fa fascinating no I, I love those ones particularly fun. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, one of my friends Roger Steer who's a, a fellow professor at Cass Business School Roger and I, uh, he used to talk about inspiring leaders have the three hums, humility, humanity, and humor. And, and you, you've always had a good chuckle and a bit of fun. And I think, I think that's very important. And if you can't trust someone, if people don't trust each other, there's no psychological safety, you'll never get anywhere. I mean, these yeah. days, you know, here you are in central France, I'm in Lincolnshire. Um, we're having a conversation, which, you know, uh, 10 years ago, we couldn't have had this kind of thing. Okay. Um, uh, and teams are now very virtual. And there's a guy, Joe English, I'm going to be, uh, not Joe English, uh, Larry English, I'm going to be interviewing later uh, this month. And Larry's written a book called Office Optional about, he's run for 20 years, his business virtually around the world. And you go, people go, well, if they're not in the office, can you trust them? Well, if you can't trust <laughs> them, you've made a mistake in the first place and you very quickly get to know. Um, but no, thank you, Joe, for, for those three. And then the next one is a, a big one for you, PQ, which is meaning and purpose. You know, you, why you do what you, why you've done what you've done. What was your sort of calling? What was your vocation? Why were you so, so driven about being a shoemaker? You could have done anything. I mean, you were in the RAF for a couple of years. You had, you saw a bit of the world and that kind of stuff and radars and things like that. But, but, but why did you do so obsessively, so consistently, Keep, you kept going, you kept on pushing at, uh, at producing a world-class brand, which you succeeded, but why, why have you done what you've done? 
Well, I guess when, when you're growing up, everybody wants to be a train driver. We used to want to be a train driver when I was young. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but I, I had an education in engineering I did college, and I had a chance to go into aerospace. Um, but I, I just felt, well, I don't know. You've not got much control on that. That, that seemed like a long journey of, you know, you don't make your own spaceship. You've got it. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I could see working for um, aerospace. I think it was De Havilland at the time. Yes, De Havilland, yeah. yeah. De Havilland, and it was De Havilland propellers, actually. They were, they were there in Bolton. So yeah. I had the option to go for an interview to do that, but no, I, I turned it down. I don't know, either I was lazy or I was not seeing, you know, maybe at that point I wasn't focused. Maybe I, you know, it was just like, well, okay, that's an opportunity, but who, who knows? And uh, in the RAF, of course, and I suppose everybody's told this, when, when you get to the end of your uh, two years as national service, you take you in and sort of say, look, if you like to stay on, we can give you, uh, we'll put you on officer's course. And, uh, and if you, you know, if you like, because we were on radar, so we were, we were controlling uh, uh, interception plans. We were controlling all the best fighting plans and whatever. That was great. And, and maybe you can train as a pilot. Well, that was tempting, wasn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was really tempting that. Mm. But you're kind to yourself, Joe. I think um, I know from my 20 years in the army that if we'd, we'd had someone at your stage who was ghastly, we would not have made the offer to, to stay on. Bye, thank you. As, as, one, lad, as one lad in the Green Howards, my local uh, regiment that I was in in Yorkshire, the commanding officer on his exit interview that you had said, so uh, Jenkins, what are you gonna do when you leave the army? And he said, I'm going to do cartwheels all the way down the I Street, sir. Cartwheels. That's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> he couldn't wait to leave. So, so yeah, you didn't do the RAF, but you, you did the family business. And that, oh, that's yeah. always quite hard, isn't it? Well, I came, we came back to family business. We, we knew that the, the family business was... You know, we'd gone away. We'd, we'd, I'd spent one year, only one year, with the family business. Jeff, he'd spent four years there. He, he went in just leaving school straight in. Um, and he went to Germany to do his, his national service. I mean, by accident, we got, he, he was deferred. That's why he went later. So we both went at the same time. And he went to Germany, sees Adidas and Puma. Mm. And when we came back, and we came back, I think I, I was back about three months before he came back. We, we came back and, uh, okay, you come back to something. And, you know, you've just had two years away. You know, mother was no longer making your bed, making your breakfast. Nothing, you know, putting everything on a plate, and all you did was go out and find the girlfriends, go to dances, go do what I used to play badminton. <laughs> yes. I spent two months playing badminton in the RAF. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was just off off the posting altogether. I was sort of uh, detached, I think they call it. I was yeah. detached, and, and then I was never attached to anything else. But they used to invite me to all these, uh, and I played for the RAF once, and Very so good. it was quite. <laughs> Um, and, and that was it. So, you know, so badminton, that's, that's, that's from my plan. Jeff, Jeff also liked running. But we, we, we come back to a company and, you know, we, we've done these things. We've done, we've been independent. It's, I, you know, it's like, you've got to learn how to look after Jack. You know, first thing you've got to do is keep yourself safe, know how to do that. Don't get the wrong side of people, get the right side of people. And you get these things, you know, you know so we come back and, uh, I think grandma was still alive then when we came back, but yeah. two months after we came back, because she held them together. She was a real yeah. firebrand. That's why I'm called Joe, by the way, because when I was born on grandfather's birthday, she insisted he'd brought his name with him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mother hated that idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But nothing against grandma. <clears throat> she held them together. When she died, they just didn't speak. Yeah. And they, they, in fact, they, they got together. Jeff and I had to bring them, pull them apart on more than one occasion. And we're saying to them, look, you know, this is a company. But, you know, we're, we're supplying people all over the world, but we've got to move forward. We've got to change. We need salesmen. We, we need to do something. We need to plan. <clears throat> no, they no. wouldn't listen. They, they drove and her to drink, didn't they? I mean, you know, I know whether they drove her to drink, but certainly that was what, in the end, one of the things that contributed to her going, didn't it? Well, um, certainly my uncle, he used to, he used to drink heavily mm. and he used to drink sort of during, during lunchtime. 
and come back and you could always smell rum and whatever. And we, we used in very uh, dangerous machinery, really, in those days, no guards and no whatever, and a big press. We had this massive great press, must have, must have weighed a couple of tons in itself. And it, and it came, you had a clutch, so you press the pedal and down it came. But yeah. it was not the best of machines and the clutch used to slip on occasions. So it used to do a double press. So you come, you know, brum, brum, yeah. <laughs> You know, and you, if you're holding a knife underneath. <laughs> Not good. Well, well, Joe, you remind me, my uh, my grandfather uh, and his brother ran a mill in Halifax. Uh, it became Crossley Carpets, but but it was it was one of the big mills in Halifax. And, and they were Quakers, so that when the money ran out, they kept their employees on, even though it broke them, essentially. And the right. accountant kept saying, you've got to fire them all. No, no, we've got to look after them and look after health well-being. But anyway, they had a guy called Albert, and Albert's job was to clean the the the, the cotton fluff because they did cottonated wool out yeah. of the the threshing machines that were w working at speed, and and one day he moved the guard down and he'd forgotten his brush, so he just tried to brush out the stuff with his fingers, and it took off two of the ends of his fingers, and there was blood everywhere, and it was gas. They stopped all the machines, they 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 got him to hospital, they had it all mended, and then. Then afterwards, a month later, when he was back with his hand bandaged up, they said, now, Albert, what happened? And they would buy the machines. They were all the machines were working. He said, I took the guard down like this, he said, Mr. Bowman, and I put my hand in and he used his other hand and he put his hand in and he took a finger off that hand, too. <laughs> so, so Albert's got fingers missing on both hands. So they also ran the bank in Halifax. The Lloyd's Bank was where my family's home was. They lost all the money, by the way. It's, it never carried down to me. We, we were penniless, lived in the caravan. But but they got Albert as the night watchman and he pulled a string and it knocked a peg in on a round, a round clock that went round to tell them that during the night, Albert had been there. And at the end of his 20 years as the night watchman, they gave him the gold fob watch. In those days, you remember the gold fob watch yes, yes. For, for loyal service. And they said, Albert, how did you do it? And he pointed to his dog and he said, sir, it was just the dog. I taught her to pull the rope. <laughs> and he, Albert must have been snoozing in his night watchman box with a dog yanking on the rope to knock the pegs in. But anyway, I got I got off on a story about Halifax and not about upgrade. <laughs> Let's go on to health and well-being, talking about losing fingers. Um, HQ is the next one. I mean, you've been in a business that's all about fitness and health and high performance. What have you personally done? You know, you were a very good badminton player. What what have you personally done? To, to, you know, you, you look in great health now at whatever age you are, and we won't, we won't ask what age you are, but you seem to be keeping yourself, you and Julie, keeping yourself in good health. W what are you doing to keep yourself mentally and physically healthy even now, but throughout your life? Because here we are in a lockdown and people are saying they've got bad mental health, but you seem to be in, in great spirits, the two of you. I, th I think if we start with mental health, I think it's a question that um, if you don't do anything, uh, if you don't keep your brain active, the, the likelihood is, is that it will. My, my mother, she suffered from dementia from the age of 85, which is where I am right now. And uh, <clears throat> she lost the last, the last five or six years of her life. They were, they were gone. Dementia had taken over. So I, I think for me, writing the book and, yeah. and, now, and now facing another challenge, and that is to get the book to be a bestseller. Mm -hmm. We're now attacking the American market. And, you know, thankfully to this, yeah, we, I'm, I'm doing podcast interviews from Australia, California. I must have done 10 in California wow. already. And, you know, it's just like this, just so clear. Everything is perfect. So, you know, we have this new technology. Wow. And, and, and this is a combination between, what, 58 when we started? No computers, no mobile phones. Yeah, I used to jump on a plane with a handful of uh, American Express travelers checks. That's about it. <laughs> dollars. Everybody accepted dollars. So it's like, you know, you know what will work. That, that's the only thing that worked in those days. Mm. So mental health, yes, I, I think it is keeping yourself going. And I used to read quite a few books. I don't think I maybe have read a handful since starting writing the book because mm. that has been so, so consuming. You know, yeah, it's yeah. it's not somebody else's story. This is my story. This is yeah, and and surprisingly enough, it evolves and it's still evolving. Yeah, the memory keeps coming back. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember that. 
yeah. And somebody, somebody will have read it or whatever. Come out. I don't, yeah. Remember when? Oh, wow. Yes, I remember. <laughs> so it's like <clears throat> I, I could do another book, <laughs> the same yeah. story, the same story, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> different, and different, I, I, I think I think you make a great point, Joe. That um, I've known people way younger than you that they retire at sixty or whatever it is, even in the army, fifty-five. And then they start to deteriorate because they they're not they haven't really got a purpose in their life anymore. And the brain's going done the job. OK, let's finish. And and some of them die way too young. And it's probably just by giving up. And, and you definitely have not. You've still got the fire in the belly and you, you're still full of energy. And I love that. Yeah, well, I think I think it's exciting. OK, um, I can't physically I can't do the things I used to. I can't play badminton. I played tennis. Um, I used to be able to beat Julie at tennis all the time. Then it's, it just changed. And now, boom, yeah. If I could pick up a tennis racket, which I can't anymore. Yeah. She should knock me off the court all the time. That was it. <laughs> but, but, so I, I like playing games. I do go, I did go out running and I do go out walking. Uh, I can't run anymore. I have a new knee. I have a new hip. I've, I've had that many bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> This is the problem with playing badminton or playing sport. You know, you yeah. around and a lot of these footballers are hobbling around. They've got this yeah. problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You wear out that. Yeah. I could do with a good joinery outfit now just to replace everything. <laughs> my, uh, well, I'm left handed and my left shoulder went. So yeah, playing tennis, this is one of the problems. Playing badminton, I don't know if you play badminton or tennis. Yes, I have, and tennis, yeah. Yeah. With badminton, it's like little flicks and all sorts of twists and turns. You try and do that with a tennis racket, which, no. yeah, no, which of course, this is the problem. I play badminton to a, a, a good level. I yeah. didn't want to play tennis to a good level. I wanted it for fitness. Yes. But I can't forget the movements of playing badminton. So yes. I'm, I'm trying badminton shots. Uh, totally unthinking. Totally. Yeah. I, I don't want to do it on purpose. But And, then, and this is... Yeah. Really done this shoulder pretty badly. Yes. And this other shoulder's gone because when this shoulder goes, you start pushing with this, everything you do. Yes. It, yeah, so so yeah. shoulders have gone. So, so really, if anybody knows a really good sort of you know, strip me down and put me a new frame. <laughs> <laughs> we can rebuild you. We'll have a bionic version of you. Now so, let's go, let's now. let's go on to EQ, which is emotional and social intelligence, uh, the next component round. And um, one of the things that came out strongly in your book it is you were really good at making connections with people and people who would very generously help you out. Um, mm. You know, John Johnson and people like that who, who really worked well with you. Uh, and that was about your ability to listen, build rapport, draw people in, influence them, ask for their help. Uh, what would be a tip you'd give about emotional intelligence to, to people listening that you've found helpful? Well, <clears throat> I think it is that when you, you're on a path, whatever that path may be, the road is there. Other people are on that road as well. Um, a lot more people are sharing space, not the same space, but we talk about Johnny Johnson. Um, John Willie was, uh, he, he was in footwork. That was his road. He had, he had a massive mill full of workers and they made, uh, I think they made those slippers to begin with. You know, and he used to say to me, I've got to make six pence a pair. I said, I'm happy. I'm really happy making six beds of it. I said, okay, Johnny, that's great. And of course, uh, it's in the book where yeah, I used to go around to these sales uh, because at that time, the whole of the shoe industry was just moving to the Far East. The, uh, the government had decided that they couldn't support uh, footwear or even clothing, and everything was going there. So I would say probably two, maybe even three footwear uh, visitors were going out of business every month. And oh. I would, at least once a month, I would go around to these sales. And every time I went, Johnny Johnson was there. And he'd just sit there. He had the, he had the pride of place. He'd just sit in front of the auctioneer, uh, Mr. Smith, I've forgotten his first name. And uh, you know, the auctioneer would sell things off. And if it didn't sell, he'd just look at John Billy. And John just nod. And then we move on. <laughs> After, after it was over, John Willard would disappear into Mr. Smith's office and they'd obviously come up with some sort of, well, there's all this, this, this. And then he'd take it all up to Bake Up, which in Bake Up is big, and his big mill, and he, he had his mill where he, but this was his, his factory, and this one, he stored all this stuff. And talk about stuff, stuffed crocodile, 
so a stuffed bear he had in there. And, you know, I mean, in you know, those early days, officers would have these sort of things, these relic, and he'd take everything, everything was in there. And uh, as I say in the book, you know, I mean, he, I think he took pity on me. I, I know yeah. the auctioneer did on one time because I'm bidding for something. And the auctioneer is sort of saying, come on, guys, anybody else? This guy's got <laughs> more, more guts than money. Because <laughs> I was bidding beyond probably what he thought I should be bidding. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> a great story. That's a great story, Joe. And Joe, moving on to the next one uh, is CQ, which is Cultural Intelligence Quotient. This is about adapting to different cultures and people who are different from you and your upbringing. You know, your, your time in the Royal Air Force and your brother's time in Germany with the forces gave you a different view. And then of course you started traveling the world and seeing different people and particularly breaking into the American market. And the Americans are very different in, in how they do business and how they, how have you learned to read and adapt other cultures? And it's back to the big words these days, diversity, equality, and inclusion, including people seeing people as, as just like us. How have you learned to cope with different cultures and what advice would you give people who find that hard? Yeah, I, well, I, I must admit, I probably had as much experience as most people or any people, because I, uh, after getting the American market going, I spent another 10 years traveling the globe, putting on the global distribution, meeting with Japanese and you, you sit there and you, you respect a totally different respect. Absolutely, totally the opposite to America, yeah. where everything is sort of thrown at you. It's free wheel and it's whatever. Um, and in a way, you you've got to be a bit like a chameleon. You've got to be able to uh, accept what they do and appreciate it. Uh, I remember in in Japan, I went a few times, and the Japanese once they finish work, they don't go home. They go to a club. They go to whatever. They, they spend at least an hour and they're waited on by geisha girls and whatever it is. So, you know, okay, we do this. And then they bought a bottle of whiskey. And they, and they each of them, they have a bottle of whiskey and they have a slot on the wall where they put their whiskey. So when, when they come in, the geisha girl wants to get their bottle of whiskey. And so they bought one for me. <laughs> and somewhere, probably somebody drunk it by now because I, I think we only got halfway down my bottle, this bottle of whiskey, but... Uh, I think somebody did give me the tag that goes onto the bottle with my name in Japanese. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think it was somewhere, I don't know where it is at the moment, but uh, we had that. But they, they were so, uh, I can say, they, they loved what they did. And we went to some of the offices, we went to in Japan, some real, the big companies. Because Japan, uh, a company doesn't, uh, the distributor doesn't import. The big conglomerates do the importation. Um, I think it Mary Benny, I think it was Mary Benny and uh, Onitsuka or something. No, not Onitsuka, that's... Uh, that was in uh, Nike, wasn't it? That was Nike, yes. Yeah. But it, it was two, so one company does the importation and the other company does distribution. And, and we have, I'm scratching heads and I'm talking to people and find, you know, how can we cut out this, this piece and uh, I, I'm thinking about this and we're talking about it. I said, well, to be honest, we don't because that is their system. Yeah. That is what they do. Uh, whereas in America, of course, it's, oh, everything's up there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I've been going to America and it wasn't too long before I had this sort of mid-Atlantic accent. <laughs> <laughs> I get a little bit of a drawl in there. And I work, you know, not okay. You know, things stretch out a bit. Yeah. And, and I had my assistant, Dave, and he used to come across on occasion because we were, he was doing more marketing. And he's chaffing away there. And Paul Feynman sat next to me. And Paul turned around and said, Joe, what did he say? <laughs> because Dave had a good Lancashire accent. Real good language, you accent. And Paul said, What did he say? And, and Dave, he, Dave almost flew up to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Dave, no, accept the fact. You know, you're okay in Lancashire. You can be whatever. And he was quite a bright lad. I mean, he wasn't a stupid mm. boy. Uh, I said, you know, you've just got to listen and be yeah. able to be. 
Yeah. Yeah. Adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Adapt. Yeah. Be humble and adapt to their culture. Brilliant. And then uh, the, the next one is uh, RQ, resilience quotient, uh, coping with adversity, setbacks, disappointments. What, what's your philosophy that stood you in good stead about coping with knocks and setbacks and how you pick yourself back up, Joe? Well, um, I think the worst one when I was in business was when Jeff died. We, we had just, we just got the agreement with Paul Fame. We just brought him into America. Aztec had just become accepted with Runner's World. We got the hook. We were in to America and Jeff died. Hmm. Uh, he was an athlete, he, he loved, but he pushed himself too much. And I think because of that, yeah, he, he used to be both cycling and whatever. And he used to be sick at the end because he pushed himself too much and he got stomach cancer. And just oh. that was it. He just died. And it was like, oh. this was sort of, it was a two edged two thing because when Jeff was alive, we had myself, Jeff, and two wives. And, and I, I, was, I was the one who was always pushing. It was like, oh, come on, 1968, opportunity to go to America. Why do you want to go to America? Jeff didn't say it, but it, was, it came from the wives. Like, you know, you, uh, and Jeff never, we, we never had a, an argument. He looked after the factory. He loved the factory. Mm. I didn't say I hated the factory. I didn't know, but you know, I, Jeff wanted me to do everything else. You do everything else. You look after it, and which I did. And, uh, but he loved it. But you know, it, it was that, and when he died, all of a sudden, it was just me. Yeah. I lost two women because once Jeff wasn't there. And, and so this is, this is the blade. I can make all the decisions now. Mm. You know, you, you think, but that's wrong. You know, your brother's just died. Mm. And, and so it was almost like saying, okay, that we've got to redouble the effort. You know, we're going to win this. We, we, uh, Jeff's not here anymore, but come on, it's going to happen. And I could turn around and make decisions, which some people may have felt, God, you, know, you didn't consult anybody. No, mm. I knew what I wanted. And so you have these, these double-edged things, which, you know, some way you're destroyed, but then you find the answer. You yeah. find somebody yeah. to do this. You put somebody else in the factory. And it was at that time when we knew our factory was small. We just got something which was, boom, suddenly a hundred times bigger than our factory. We've been talking with people, Barter, my friend from Barter. Yeah, Barter. With him. And then we're talking with people from South Korea. So we knew our factory was becoming less and less important because we were needing production. But still, I had to bring somebody else in, somebody else to do design. But we did that. Mm. And, and, I, and, I, and I think to a, an extent, which is probably not a good thing, and good and bad could have come out of Jeff dying. Good yeah. was yeah. I made decisions and I, I just went. Yeah. And I just kept it going. Yeah. And the bad thing was that I don't know what the decisions would have been if Jeff had still been around. Yes. Whether whether we would have grown, whether we would have not been able to do these uh, these moves. Yes. So, uh, you know, this is fate. Yeah, yeah. It, it is is fate, and and you've ended up with a, a world class brand, and that's my next question. BQ is it's the almost the last of the two. Um, uh, brand quotient is about your image, your reputation, what people say about you when you're not in the room, Joe. What, what advice would you give people about personal brand? I mean, clearly you've got a world-class brand, but, but you as a leader, your brand and what people say about you and whether you ever listened to any feedback or whether you just plowed ahead, regardless of what others thought, what was, what was your learning and what advice would you give now? Well, I think you've always got to listen. Always. It's listening is so important. Um, and it, it's like employing people. <laughs> If you can't employ somebody who can do it better than you, there's not much point in employing them. Yeah. You have to employ people who can do it better than you can do. And you have to be able to recognize that. If you can recognize somebody is good, somebody can do something really good, then I'm not a good salesman. Some people can really sell. And, uh, and I think you have to listen and let them move forward. That's why this wasn't the Joe Foster brand. Mm. This was Reebok. And I wanted everybody to feel part of Reebok. You know, yeah. They've got to be in love with it. They've got to be in love with it as much as I'm in love with it. They've got to feel ownership. And yeah. 
but allowing them to feel ownership, not saying, look, just a minute, I'm the boss, I'm the boss, I made the decision. No, 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 come on. Uh, which which that, that leads me nicely into the eighth of the components before we go on, which is legacy, uh, legacy question, LQ, before we go on to talk about teams you've been in, and then we'll do a book recommendation and we'll end with your top tip. Um, but uh, what, what would you like your legacy to be? I mean, here you are, you're 85 years old, you're still in great health, but, but your legacy is clearly Reebok. Um, but on a personal note, there you're married, Julie, what would you like your legacy to be? Well, I think, again, I, I think your legacy has got to be integrity and it's got to be um, focus. Mm. You've got to have focus. And if people can see that you're not wandering off all over the place, you are focused. So you know, your legacy is, this is Reebok. You know, let's all get focused. Let's be a team. And if you have something to say, come on. And it's not a matter of trying to take over meetings. It's a matter of not even being in a meeting if you can be that way, because you do have a final decision, but you don't want to push that. You don't want to make that. You mm. want the decisions to come out. And yeah. if the decisions come out, then fine. That, that's, a, that's a really good point, which leads us on to, you just talked about it, uh, executive teams. When you've been part of teams, uh, what have made good high-performing business teams that you've been part of in Reebok? Or, or in your uh, your upbringing, even in the Royal Air Force, uh, and uh, and when, when you've been part of a toxic team when it hasn't worked, what what are your lessons in both? You know, high performing teams versus toxic teams. Well, toxic teams. I've not been in many toxic teams. I don't think I have a. I, I didn't see the point sometimes in getting involved in people where you could see there was something to, better. Better no, you know. Better to be away from that. Um, especially when, if you, as I was, I, you know, I owned the company 100% at one time. And, and so it was a matter that, you know, I didn't want people, I didn't, it was better if people came to me and said, I'd like to work for you. you know, oh, I, I'd like to do this. Rather than saying, I need, I need a person to do something. I need, and, and go out and look for it. It's better that people you, that come to you and you can fit them in. So that was, so toxic teams, I don't know too much about it because I, I didn't, uh, I, I suppose really the teams that I was probably not in, in control of was in America. Yeah, yeah. They were, they were in control. And whilst I would have liked to see some different things happen, you know, how do you, uh, how do you say, say to anybody, no, we don't do that when they're going from a $9 million company to a $30 million company, to a $90 million company, to a $300 million company, to a $900 million company in successive years, how do you turn around and say they're not doing it right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't, especially not in America. And, it, and that was the, the fastest growing company ever in America at that time. That's before, the, uh, before all the digital age came in and we got all the... The apples and the Googles and the rest, yeah. All that came in, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's that's a great that's a great tale, actually. Yeah, and um, and then from from teams on to a, a book. Uh, apart from your outstanding book, is there another book that you've read recently that you've or or throughout your life that you found is a good book on leadership that that people can turn to? Because even some of the old classics are really good. Do you have a, a favorite book that you'd recommend to people? Well, I mean, I, I, I've read quite a lot of books and I used to read. Whilst I was in the, uh, in the RAF, we joined what was then the book club. I think it was a companion book club. And quite a few of us brought it. So you, you had a new book every month and you could read whatever. And we read a lot of books. Leadership, I'm not too sure. I think for me, uh, leadership wasn't a book. Leadership was Churchill. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And, and I've read a few of Churchill's books. Um, maybe some are uh, interesting, maybe some are not, but I don't know. Um, Mary Solms, Churchill's youngest daughter, yes. uh, brought together a book of, because uh, Churchill used to write notes to his wife, and, and his wife used to write back. What was his wife called again? Clementine. Clementine, Clem. Clementine, yeah, Clemmy. Okay. So he, he was writing to Clem, and she was writing to him, Piggy. She called him Piggy. <laughs> he was he was quite a sort of piggy like character wasn't he yeah. round and rosy and sort of that yeah. and if if ever 
you, you get some time yeah. because you can you can take it bits and bits. We have, we have can you pass me the book? We have this book, and so uh, I don't know why they kept these notes, even though they were living together, they wrote notes to each other. And this, this is the book speaking for speaking for themselves. themselves. Okay, yeah, I like it. And I'll tell you, they're all letters and. You can see how big it is. I mean, this, this, yeah. this is a big book. So they used to write letters to each other. Wow. Uh, pass these on. And some of those, are, those insights, absolutely fascinating. Yes, yeah. No, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. Well, Joe, we're coming to the end. And if you'd, we're just going to do the, the top tip, a couple of minutes of your favorite, almost a bit like um, a, a sort of favorite top practical tip about leadership or running a business or whatever it might be. And so if you just now, uh, just introduce yourself once more, um, explain about um, uh, being the founder of Reebok and then give your top tip and then we'll wrap up and just have a chat after we come off air. So over to your top tip. Well, I am Joe Foster. I am the founder of Reebok and we founded Reebok, I founded Reebok with my brother uh, back in uh, 1958. And my life has been quite a roller coaster. I have traveled the world such a lot. And the experiences I've had have been incredible. And I, and I think that uh, if in life you get the opportunity that I did, and that is to travel, um, to meet people, uh, to make decisions, then you, you will have done well. I know today, well, at least today, today is COVID, but in, in the age we're in, travel is much easier. But I don't, I don't think travel is the same that I had. And that travel meeting people was incredible. And I think that broadens your eyes. It makes you understand something. To, to understand other cultures. Mm. And, and I think you need to understand other cultures if you're going to go global in any way. But apart from going global, whether you're a successful business or not, I think to be a person, to have lived a life, to have met a lot of people, to have been down low and done things that dirty your hands, do whatever, and then be able to visit somebody like Prince Rainier in his, uh, in his palace in Monaco. Yeah, these are the highs, mm. the fantastic highs, to, to meet a lot of the people from Hollywood. I would never have thought that I could do that, but believe you me, there are so many nice people out there. And it's, if you are nice and you meet people openly, I think you succeed in life. Whether you succeed in business, that is a different energy you've got. And if you have that energy and succeed in life by meeting people. Uh, John Forsyth, I'd only met him once. You might know, Dynasty. He was a big man then. And he came up to me. I'd only met him once before. And this next meeting, a lot of people there. And he said, hi, Joe, how are you? Uh, and I'm speechless. <laughs> and I said, John, John, you know, how do, you, how do you remember my name? I mean, I, I'm bad at name. How do you remember my name? And he said, Joe, that's my job. <laughs> that's a very good. That's <laughs> my job. Joe, well, look, you, you, have, you have lived an incredible life thus far. There's more fun to be had. And uh, thank you so much for making the time to share with the audience uh, your experiences on the Inspiring Leadership Show. And I wish you and Julie every success and happiness in France and in getting this book to, to number one. So thank you, Joe. Much Absolutely. appreciated. We're going to do that. Number one. And number thank you. One. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's great. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Okay.